Hey everyone, and welcome to the Boost Your Biology podcast. My name is Lucas, and I am the founder of Ergogenic Health. Together in this podcast series, we will go underground to explore cutting edge health and human performance insights that you simply cannot search on Google to help you upgrade your existence. So without any further ado, let's jump into today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today's special guest is a tenured associate professor at the University of South Florida, Morsani College of Medicine in the Department of Molecular Pharmacology and Physiology. He teaches medical neuroscience, medical physiology, nutrition, and neuropharmacology. He is also a research scientist at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition to assist with their efforts towards optimizing the safety, health, and resilience of the warfighter and astronaut. So, Dr. Dominic D. Agostino, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Lucas. Yeah, I appreciate being on. Awesome. So, Dom, maybe you want to let my listeners know a little bit about yourself and how you got so fascinated into learning more about ketones. Yeah, well, I majored in nutrition, you know, when I was an undergrad and I was very passionate about nutrition and fitness and got steered into neuroscience and physiology for my PhD. And the 90s, when I did my PhD, was kind of the decade of the brain. And neuroscience programs were just neuroscience in general was very interesting to me. And then I did my postdoctoral fellowship on oxygen toxicity which is a limitation when you're under high pressures of oxygen, which only really are experienced in the context of hyperbaric oxygen therapy or using a rebreather device that's used for like special operations uh, diving. And I was a very avid diver, a recreational diver, but like advanced level diver. So I was very interested in diving physiology and oxygen toxicity seizures So seizures are the manifestation, the last manifestation of oxygen toxicity. And when you're diving or you're in a hyperbaric chamber and you pressurize it to like high pressure oxygen, the seizures come on with like no warning. So there's no way to predict the seizures and there's no way to prevent them. So the research that I did was actually developing kind of methods to predict the seizures, but really focused on preventing seizures. And I was mostly focused on pharmaceuticals to do that, various antioxidant drugs, anti-epileptic compounds and things like that. And I realized that these seizures were so powerful that the drugs really didn't have an impact on preventing these tonic-clonic seizures. So the more I delved into neuroprotective anti-seizure, I discovered the ketogenic diet. And it was very strange that I majored in nutrition, but was never taught that the ketogenic diet was a standard of care for epilepsy before drugs. And then when drugs fail, or I should say when multiple drugs fail, uh, patients are put on a ketogenic diet and about 60% or more of them actually respond very favorably. And about 15% of patients who are completely non-responsive to drugs have a complete silencing of their seizures. They never come back. So they're what we call super responders. Wow. So they're like cured of their epilepsy and they need to maintain the ketogenic diet for a period of time, and then they can come off. And that was the story of Charlie Abrams, the son of Jim Abrams, a Hollywood producer. And there was a movie made about his story that Meryl Streep started a movie about the ketogenic diet. It's called First Do No Harm. And actually, I found this so inspirational that I contacted Jim Abrams and I asked if I could incorporate his uh his story into my TEDx talk, which I gave like about 10 years ago. And he graciously agreed. And, you know, we talked for a while. And then I realized that this is like where I want to put my time and effort into research and redirect my research from drug-based therapy to nutrition or metabolic-based therapies. And that was about 2008. And I started writing grants and, you know, it took a while to get funding, but we started developing, doing ketogenic diet research on Alzheimer's mice and developing ketogenic agents. Like we were the, really the first ones to develop the idea for ketone salts, you know, or ketone electrolytes and then various ketogenic compounds, you know, 
we have like 60 different compounds that, you know, some of them are just on paper and some of them are actually formulated and we're testing them in different model systems. Well, this is what I'm really excited to get into actually in regards to the different types of ketone supplements on the market. And maybe do you want to explain to my listeners a bit of the evolution behind, you know, what were the initial compounds that were designed to increase ketone levels and to where we are today? Yeah, it's a fascinating field, actually. And it's so weird that, you know, this field existed and I did not know about it through my nutrition training at Rutgers University. I think we talked about a ketogenic diet very briefly as like just a fad diet that you wouldn't want to follow. But I didn't know, I didn't know that it was, you know, in the world of neurology as something that could control seizures. Yeah. So there are different ways to produce the state of ketosis. So one is simply prolonged fasting or an overnight fast will start to elevate your ketones. And, you know, as we fast or we go without food, the body liberates fatty acids for energy. Uh, These largely do not cross the blood brain barrier. So fatty acid oxidation in the liver will convert fats into water-soluble fat molecules, ketone bodies, beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. And then these can readily cross the brain barrier. They are excellent fuel for the brain, especially and the heart. And the only way to achieve a state of like therapeutic ketosis would be through therapeutic fasting, which has many benefits that we could talk about. Or the ketogenic diet was developed at Mayo Clinic over a hundred years ago for seizures because we knew fasting could control seizures. So the idea was that to develop a diet that would in many ways mimic fasting and that could control seizures. And we didn't really know how it was working at the time. And there's still a debate whether it's like the low glucose and the low insulin or the elevated ketones, and that's still debated. And many different researchers are looking at the mechanism of the ketogenic diet and trying to mimic it with different types of drugs. 2-deoxyglucose is one of the drugs that they're looking at, which inhibits glycolysis. So what we've come to find out in many other labs is that the ketogenic diet is not like a magic bullet. It's like a magic shotgun, right? So you have many different mechanisms working in synergy to basically enhance and preserve brain energy metabolism. And it's also changing. It's the only diet that we know of that's defined by an objective biomarker that you can measure in your breath, in your blood, and in your urine that changes the neuropharmacology of your brain. So that made it very interesting to me as a neuroscientist. You know, I did my PhD doing patch clamp electrophysiology and measuring, you know, from single neurons, membrane potential, firing frequency, and you know, tinkering around with glucose levels. And I was very interested in lactate and ketones. So it's a diet that has very interesting fundamental changes in the brain. So that's the ketogenic diet. And then, you know, the next level to produce ketosis, I would say would be ketogenic fats. And that would be like MCT oil. Uh, So, you know, there are various forms of MCT oil. It comes in a bottle uh, or powder, you know, keto brains powder, just the, you know, various uh, products that I use that are medium chain triglycerides. And that would be uh, an eight to 10 carbon uh, chain. And when we ingest these things, they're not packaged into chylomicrons like uh, fat, long chain fats. They actually go right to the liver by a hepatic portal circulation. And then they stimulate fatty acid oxidation in the liver to produce ketones independent of, independent of a carbohydrate restriction. Hmm. So, uh, so MCT oils are, are very interesting and we incorporate them into our research. And, um, so you can elevate ketones through fasting, ketogenic diet or MCT or a combination of things, which I, I like to sort of talk about too, because a lot of people talk about these things as like in a binary approach, like you could fast or you could do the key or you could take exogenous or, you know, MCT. So I, I think it's, it's really incorpor- important to leverage a lot of these different things in combination, uh, depending upon the application. It's very context dependent. And then you have ketone esters. Uh, well, I think before that, uh, there's, there's another molecule that, was, that NASA was very interested in in the 1950s and the 1960s, and MIT did, did research on 1,3-butanediol. So it's a, it's a dye alcohol which makes it a glycol. And when you consume it, 
the liver metabolizes it pretty much completely to beta hydroxybutyrate. So it's called 1,3-butanediol. And, uh, and we've done a lot of research with this compound, you know, 14, 15 years ago, I started ingesting it and, you know, I was, it kind of makes you a little bit drunk and, and, uh, you know, there's, it's not ideal, but it will produce a state of ketosis. And the Wikipedia page, I think, lists it as a hypoglycemic agent, which was very interesting to us. So we incorporated it into some of our cancer research and it would lower glucose. It would have not have any effect on insulin and it would elevate ketones. And it had a very interesting anti-cancer effect. And we used it in different models of cancer. But then we took 1,3-butanediol and we figured out a way to make a ketone ester out of that through, uh, you know, just my, through uh, doing a trans esterification with an acetoacetate precursor. And that was called uh, uh, terp butyl acetoacetate. And when you heat this up at a high concentration and uh, you can basically create a monoester or a diester of, uh, of acetoacetate, but when you consume it, it's elevating beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate at the, at the same, at a one-to-one -one ratio. And then that particular molecule was very effective for us at preventing seizures. 1,3-butanediol did not have a neuroprotective anti-seizure effect. But when we created, and uh, Patrick Arnold, the, a chemist who developed a lot of interesting compounds that, were, that got a lot of media attention, uh, actually helped me synthesize this. And we actually started using this in different uh, experiments. And uh, it had a super remarkable anti-seizure effect. And we also applied it to a cancer model, had anti-cancer effects. So as we were looking at ketone esters, we realized that uh, I was consuming them too and realized, oh, these are pretty powerful agents, but you know there were some pros and cons to them. The liver had to metabolize it. They tasted awful and they were kind of pricey to produce. So another alternative was a ketone salt of beta hydroxybutyrate. And the only salt that was available was sodium beta hydroxybutyrate. But we were thinking about it, or I was thinking about it, I was like, you could take any monovalent or divalent cation or alkaline amino acid, like, uh, you know, histidine, arginine, uh, citrulline, uh, a lysine, these divalent or basic amino acids would ionically bond to beta hydroxybutyrate. So we were thinking about, you know, different ways that you could make a ketone salt. So we started tinkering and making these ketone salts and you have, we would create, the first one was a balance ratio. The problem with a ketone salt is that you would have a sodium overload. You'd get too much sodium. But if you balance it out with other electrolytes, uh, there's an electrolyte product that I use. I keep it like on my desk. It's uh, Element. Yep. LMNT, you know, so, uh, so that it didn't, it didn't provide, you know, that ratio of, of electrolytes is very good. I like the product. It tastes really good, you know, uh, and, but there's another, you know, over the years, we kind of developed different things or work with different companies to develop. And then Keto Start kind of uses that electrolyte combination, but instead of binding the electrolyte to like a chloride ion or, or something else, the electrolyte is bound to beta hydroxybutyrate. So when you consume a ketone salt, it's giving your body electrolytes that you need kind of more of if you're on a low carb diet or ketogenic diet. And it's also delivering, you know, a beta hydroxybutyrate at the same time. So um, over the years of like testing a lot of different things on myself, kind of, I gravitated to, you know, tinkering with different electrolyte formulations that were bound to ketones and realized, wow, this is the way to go, you know, and just personally testing it in animal model systems, cell-based systems and, and myself. So, uh, so then, you know, then you have a whole potpourri, if you want to consider of ways to produce ketosis, you know, there's long-term you know, fasting, short-term intermittent fasting, uh, ketogenic fats, MCT, you know, MCTs, a ketone esters, 1,3-butanediol, and ketone electrolytes or ketone salts. Hmm. So you have a lot of tools in the toolbox to really elevate a, elevate a metabolite that not only can provide an alternative form of energy to the brain and the heart and the muscles, but I, I mostly think about the brain, 
but you also have a metabolite that has very profound anti-inflammatory effects. And uh, a lot of the research that we're doing in our lab is looking at metabolic control of epigenetic regulation. So beta hydroxybutyrate through functioning on, uh, you know, as influencing or elevating histone uh, deacetylase inhibitor, different HDAC uh, enzymes uh, is, is one way that it can influence epigenetic regulation. And it could also do it via something called beta hydroxybutyrylation, where the beta hydroxybutyrate directly interacts with the histone and influences gene uh, transcription translation. Right, so we're actually studying a model of Kabuki syndrome. Uh, prior to that, we studied Angelman syndrome, and you know we're really looking at these metabolites not only as energy molecules, but really like a hormone or a drug. So beta hydroxybutyrate can kick on many different signaling pathways that can have profound neuroprotective anti seizure effects, but anti cancer effects, anti inflammatory effects. Uh, you know, they activate, you know, increase BDNF in the brain, enhance learning and memory. So that's really where my passion and interest lies, like being able to develop novel ways to elevate beta hydroxybutyrate within a, a blood level or range that is therapeutic and context dependent for different, different disorders. Yeah. Now, you mentioned, and out of curiosity, Dom, you mentioned um, 2-deoxy-D-glucose. Um, I'd love yeah. to learn a little bit more about what may be some of the shortcomings or drawbacks associated with this molecule or you know, why, why were we interested in this and what does it actually do? Yeah, so 2-deoxy-glucose is really interesting. I, I purchased it when I was doing a postdoctoral fellowship actually back in Ohio as a glycolytic inhibitor. And uh, I was really interested in this idea of, uh, of really like killing cancer cells, you know, uh, but I was actually looking at it from, we're looking at mechanistically how different, you know, signaling pathways were working in neurons. And I had a variety of different cell, cell models in our freezer. And one was, uh, one was uh, U87, uh, MG cells. And this is a glio, glioblastoma cell that was derived from like a 44-year-old patient. And I was actually using it as a neuronal model system for something. I was using a, a variety of different cell bases, but it was very easy to work with because cancer cells grow, they're easy to maintain. But I noticed that 2-deoxyglucose at a certain concentration was completely non-toxic to uh, primary dissociated hippocampal neurons and primary dissociated cord cortex neurons, and that they could actually function fine if you're inhibiting gly glycolysis, if you're giving them ketones. Whereas if cancer cells, if you gave them 2-deoxyglucose, it would kill all the cells. And I, I found that very interesting. And, uh, and that later led to some of our cancer research. But the, uh, you know, people who study the ketogenic diet and basic scientists are always looking for a ketogenic diet in a drug, right? And there's clinical trials now on 2-deoxyglucose. When you give 2-deoxyglucose, it inhibits hexakinase, which is an enzyme. Uh, it's kind of like a gatekeeping. It's kind of like the regulatory enzyme for glycolysis. And cancer cells have elevated hexakinase too, uh, which there's a couple of drugs that inhibit that too. Uh, so I, uh, I became interested in pharmacological ways to mimic the ketogenic diet and ultimately settled on, you know, exogenous ketones, right? So, but 2-deoxyglucose has been in our toolbox for the cancer, anti-cancer effects. And uh, the, the main problem with 2-deoxyglucose with inhibiting glycolysis is that uh, at, if you go above 25 milligrams per kilogram, it starts to become cardiotoxic. So, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting because the heart really only uses about 10% of its energy uh, from uh, glucose. So the heart really, the heart really runs off of, uh, it just has massive energetic demands. Yeah. So it mostly runs off fatty acids, a little bit of lactate, amino acids, and maybe some ketones too. If you're on a ketogenic diet, but uh, but uh, 2-deoxyglucose was not uh, 
it was like one of those things that the effective dose for seizure control was approaching the dose that was cardiotoxic, you know, something to, to use long term. Uh, so yeah, I studied that actually before I got into, uh, to ketones and then I gravitated to like, you know, the ketogenic diet and then the military was not very, uh, excited about giving, you know, Navy SEALs a high fat, you know, <laughs> low carb diet effects on performance. And, you know, there's some performance studies going on now. It looks like if you're an elite level endurance athlete, you're okay. But if you're doing more like you know, high intensity work and things like that. Uh, ketogenic diet would be inhibiting pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And basically that's the rate limiting, limiting enzyme for, uh, you know, glycolytic activity. So you don't, you don't want to do that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you're asking about 2-deoxyglucose and I think it's, it's one of the drugs and it has its applications, but it would not be, maybe I tinkered with a little bit, you know, when it, it, back in the day, but it, it would not be something that I would want to take, you know, personally. Uh, although I think for people who just cannot tolerate like a ketogenic diet or something like that, I think it does have applications in the world of uh, seizure control, maybe. Yeah. Now let's sort of like pivot and sort of dive deep into um, how exogenous ketones can be applied for endurance training or endurance exercise. What research have we seen in, in terms of how exogenous ketone use can enhance uh, um, athletic performance? Yeah, you know what? I'm like the biggest skeptic when it comes to exogenous ketones and athletic performance. You know, I, I feel, um, well, a little bit of backstory. So, you know, when I was delving into the ketogenic diet and this idea when the Department of Defense said, you know, the ketogenic diet seems like it could potentially be effective for oxygen toxicity seizures. They said, uh, well, go maybe work on a ketogenic diet in a drug, you know? So uh, I started searching around and, and found MCT oil could elevate ketones, but, uh, and this might've not been in the public domain, but I was in like, I was in like a system within the Department of Defense <laughs> And then uh, I also saw that Department of Defense and DARPA, which is like, you know, they, they fund some really interesting stuff. They had a, had a program where they were, they had funded about, I think about at the time, it might've been eight to $10 million of funding to develop a ketone ester for, uh, for enhancing warfighter performance. Wow. So that got me even more excited because, you know, I'm, I, the idea of developing an anti-seizure uh, mitigation strategy for oxygen toxicity that could also enhance performance mm. became very became very exciting for me. And the work was being done. Some of the work was being done at NIH, and some of it was being done at Oxford University on rowers and and cyclists later. So, uh, so there there appeared to be an advantage in elite level athletes, but it was like maybe a, a 2%, maybe 3% uh, increase in, in watts and in, in work output. And uh, so I, I think if we talk about the low hanging fruit of exogenous ketones, I would put exercise performance at the top of the tree so that it would not be sort of like the low hanging fruit. And actually we've, I've never really put my time and effort into writing, you know, grants for exogenous ketones. But with that said, with our studies where we give exogenous ketones, for example, uh, for the Alzheimer's mouse model, and you put them on a treadmill, they run like 20 or 30% longer. Wow. You know, so we saw these effects in, in mice and rodents, and it maybe appeared to be a little bit, a little bit more robust effect in, in rodent models. But, uh, you know, we also saw that with the ketogenic diet, it could just be, you know, they just have more energy, you know, fats have more energy. Uh, but in the context of, so exogenous ketones do have performance enhancing effects, but they tend to have it in the context of extreme environments. Right. So for example, you know, in, with oxygen toxicity, you're going to have higher performance if you're not having a seizure, right? And so... Uh, so that's so the brain is functioning and the central nervous system is functioning better and more efficiently, and then that could translate to uh, an increased physical performance. Uh, also, when you go to altitude, for reasons we don't completely understand, 
But we do know from previous research that when you take athletes to altitude or anybody altitude and you put them on a treadmill or you look at athletic performance and you you juice them up with uh, with with carbohydrates, with glucose, you don't have the same performance augmentation with a carbohydrate supplement at altitude that you do at one atmosphere. So, you know, at, at normal baric, you know, uh, normoxic level. So it was always very interesting to me that something at altitude is inhibiting uh, glucose utilization and carbohydrate, uh, you know, oxidation. So I think in the context of extreme environments where you have maybe insulin resistance, impaired glucose metabolism, or impaired uh, glucose availability, then ketones become a very powerful alternative energy source. And, uh, and, and at altitude where you have an impaired glycolytic activity for reasons we don't, I don't think completely understand, it might be a, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, uh, or you know, glucose oxidation pathways are inhibited, then elevating ketones may have an ergogenic effect in the context of low oxygen availability. So, I mean, that's what we study. So I built my whole career on uh, extreme environments. So from hypoxic environment to the you know, hyperoxic environment. And we've done this in you know, studying mitochondria, studying cells, studying animals, uh, humans, uh, we put them in chambers and even myself, you know, I've lived in a hyperbaric environment under the water for like 10 days, you know, training with astronauts. Wow. Actually, uh, three of the aquanauts, the Nemo aquanauts, Samantha Christopher Eddy, Jessica Watkins and Shell Lindgren, I think they just came down from there on ISSS. They're part of SpaceX Crew 4. They came down uh, wow. yesterday. <laughs> so, you know, I, I have a lot of passion and 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 interest in extreme environments. And I think that's what really locked me into ketones even more because I realized that the main benefits are extreme environments. And when people are putting them, their bodies into extreme situations, I think that's when the ketones will offer an ergogenic advantage. Yeah, it's super fascinating. Um, I'd like to sort of shift gears into, I guess, like in relation to the neuropharmacological aspect and application for some of these ketone esters, one thing that we do know for sure is that these ketone, exogenous ketone use or being in ketosis will fortify and strengthen GABAergic tone in the brain. So maybe let's discuss a little bit about, you know, could potentially 1,3-butanol or some of these exogenous ketones mimic the benefits of alcohol without any of the um, side effects, I guess? Yeah, I, I became very interested in this at least 10 years ago and uh and actually kind of had an idea that this could be used for alcohol use disorder and i i still think it could be I, actually i wanted to file a patent but i saw that someone i think i think there was existing uh, uh intellectual property on that or did, prior art on that as they would say so I, I think there's a lot of potential there for using uh for using ketogenic compounds for uh, substance abuse disorders. So I'll say that, right? And maybe even like the benzodiazepines and maybe opioids, uh, which might be working through, 1,3-butanediol is a dialcohol or glycol and it, it, it has like a, a semi-narcotic effect, you know, at, at higher levels. And we don't actually know, it might be working through the GABA, GABAergic mechanism, but that has not been fully established. But what we do know from our research and, and other research is that when you give, uh, well, we knew that the ketogenic diet could elevate GABA. So, uh, and, and that did that, and the research that we did in various mouse model systems showed that it increases the activity, the production and activity of the enzymes that make GABA. So that would be uh, GAD65 and GAD67. So glutamic acid decarboxylate. So you have glutamate, which is your main excitatory neurotransmitter, GABA is actually made from glutamate. And right. that, that conversion or that synthesis of GABA is via the enzymes glutamic acid decarboxylase. So we see that, you know, when we do like PCR and look at that and look at that protein, that that is elevated. When uh, on mice eating a standard diet, when you give them a ketone ester or a ketogenic agent. And and this. This was is very interesting because we were get, 
well, my wife was, my wife does a lot of the research. She's actually like in the trenches running the experiments. I'm the guy on the podcast, you know, running, running the lab, but she observed during her experiments and seizure experiments with oxygen toxicity, when she would administer the ketogenic agents to the rats, they were very easy to hold and they're very calm. It's like they had an attenuated uh, fear response. So they're like really chill and just, they just had much less anxiety. She's a behavioral neuroscientist and said, hey, we should like study this. And I was like, well, I don't really have any, any, any funding to study that particular, but somehow we scraped up some funding and and we did, we did what's called the elevated plus maze where the yeah. animals are on like an elevated plus and they could fall off and, you know, they go, they stay in the open arm if they're less anxious and they go in the closed arm if they're more anxious. And we did a, a very well, uh, you know, methodological approach. And we've done since then, we've done a lot of different studies on behavior, anxiety and things, but there was a very robust effect with, with the elevated plus maze with the ketone salts and the MCTs when we combined that and we administered it. And it was like similar to Valium. It was similar to like a benzodiazepine drug. The animal stayed in the open arm about almost 30% longer. Uh, so it like reversed a lot of the, 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 the fear response, the, uh, the antisocial response, and they were just on the open arm much longer. And we published that. And then mechanistically, we started, we published a couple of papers after that. The open, the open arm thing is to assess the ability for uh, an animal to explore a novel environment. Is that, is that correct? Well, uh, yeah, that's the novel object recognition. And then we do that a couple. So the elevated plus maze is like if you had a catwalk that was elevated and it was like a dangerous environment and it would be like you had the option to walk out on the catwalk and it was like a very narrow catwalk that you could fall off the edge and it was like a scary environment or you could go and hide in the cave, you know, so... The animals that were in a state of ketosis, yeah, were much more kind of exploratory. It would stay in the open arm and just be much more comfortable in, in their environment. And, uh, you know, it's one of these things that drug companies use to assess anti-anxiety drugs. And we had a very robust effect. And it mimicked what we saw that when you, we gave these animals acutely gavage to them with a ketogenic agent, they're much easier to hold and it was much easier to conduct the actual experiments of putting the animal in the chamber. And then, you know, they they have these little bio wearable devices on them that we implant into their brain and then their heart. We have a diaphragmatic EMG, we have an EKG, and then we have electrodes that go. And so we measure EEG, wow. diaphragmatic uh, EMG, and then we have EKG. And we have like 14 channels of data going to the computer. And then we pressurize the chamber to five atmospheres of oxygen. We also have like a, a uh, camera recording system in there. And typically like an animal would have a seizure in about five minutes at five atmospheres of oxygen. And, uh, you know, it, since even the, the very first administration of a, of the ketone ester, you know, it was like an hour, the animal was in there for an hour. And that was like above and beyond pretty much anti, any anti-seizure drugs. So, uh, you know, in every, every animal that we tested after, we always see this very robust effect, um, so, and it's doing that through probably GABA, elevating GABA. It's also doing it by functioning as an antioxidant. The ketones enhance mitochondrial function. And when the brain is metabolizing ketones as a source of energy, it's producing less oxygen free radicals, superoxide. So we measure that in the lab and that goes down. And then adenosine, adenosine receptor signaling also is changed in a way that calms the brain down and makes it function in a more stabilized way. And then it's also decreasing neuroinflammation. So when, and when an animal has a seizure, it triggers like a kindling effect. And then you know, seizures beget seizures. So what the ketones tend to do, and, and you know, in patients, you see this with the ketogenic diet, the post, what's called post-ictal effects. So when you have a seizure, like typically the patient will be like totally out of it for hours after. But if someone's on a ketogenic diet and they have a breakthrough seizure and they're not fully controlled yet, they recover very quick from, from the seizure. That post-ictal phase is very low. And that means that the brain is just getting more energy. You know, it's not, it's not disrupting the, the neural circuitry as much. 
Mm. So, you know, there's like a very, it's a multifaceted uh, array of things that are happening. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the innovative thing that we observed was that the animals, the rats that we tested this on, they were eating normal high carbohydrate rat chow. Wow. So we were administering the ketogenic agent 30 minutes before the experimental paradigm. And that could be the seizure studies or the, you know, the anxiety studies or a wide variety of things we do in the lab. Interesting. What about currently now, like at the moment, Dom, like are there specific clinical trials that you're really excited to see the data from? Like I'm sure there's perhaps some that are happening literally right now that you're really excited to see what the data presents. Like, Maybe do you want to explore what's happening, like the, the latest research right now? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's a very nascent field. Uh, the ketogenic diet isn't, but exogenous ketone supplementation is, I think, which adds a, a layer of novelty to ketogenic therapies and metabolic therapies. Uh, so, I mean, it's almost hard to like go through all the different applications, but if you just go to like clinicaltrials.gov, which is a really good source for that, and type in like ketone supplement, you'll find uh, hundreds of, you know, at 10 years ago, obviously there was nothing because no one was studying these things. And like five years ago, there might've been like 10 studies, registered clinical trials. And now there's like, there's like over a hundred, <laughs> you know, wow. clinical trials on, on ketone supplements. Everything from, you know, there's a lot of uh, athletic performance, which I said, I, I've always thought is a low hanging fruit. So I, I think that exogenous ketones will offer an edge, uh, but mostly in the context of an extreme environment. But the other things are alcohol use disorder that you mentioned. And so you, you kind of call that one out. Uh, you know, a lot of Alzheimer's disease, there's cancer studies, there's Parkinson's, there's a lot of like rare metabolic diseases that you would, you would think of. Uh, for example, things that we study in the lab are like glucose transporter type one deficiency syndrome. It's like, you know, these inborn errors of metabolism where the ketogenic diet is actually the standard of care, but the kids can't really follow it because it's very hard to follow. So the, the, Exogenous ketones are a way to circumvent the dietary restriction that is almost impossible for many of these patients to follow uh, and it allows the elevation of the ketone body, which then has the therapeutic effect on. Yeah. And, and in the context of glucose transporter type one deficiency syndrome, it's basically the kids kind of wake up when their ketones get elevated, their blood glucose is normal, but the glucose does not cross the blood brain barrier. So if you do, if you look at the cerebrospinal fluid glucose levels, it's below two millimolar. So their, their brain is severely hypoglycemic, although their blood, it could be normal glycemic, right? So, but the ketones readily cross the blood brain barrier via the monocarboxylic acid transporter and also into the mitochondria in the brain and, and through the, uh, the cell membrane. So yeah, there's a wide variety of studies uh, that are pathophysiologically linked to impaired glucose metabolism. And you'll find these on clinicaltrials.gov. The ones that I'm most excited about are like age-related cognitive decline, Alzheimer's disease, enhancing, you know, reversing mild cognitive impairment. Uh, and of course, again, you know, the ketones are going to have their most beneficial effects when there's a deficit. Yeah. So, and then, so the, the question I don't think is being funded, but it is a very interesting question. If you have, if you are already cognitively sharp and you're a normal, healthy person and you take exogenous ketones, will it enhance, you know, yeah. performance? And, you know, I could tell you, you know, from a subjective level, if your energy level is low, if you're on like calorie restricted diet or fat, and then you take exogenous ketones, like it does nothing to your glucose, your glucose will actually go down. Uh, a large dose of a ketone ester will increase insulin. And that's yeah. probably not the best thing to do. Whereas a ketone salt product, the ketone electrolyte salt, does not elevate ketones enough. It keeps it into that one to two millimolar range where you're delivering the ketones, but you're not, you don't get the counter-regulatory 
uh, rebound effect of the elevated insulin. So that's why actually why I use ketone salts, you know, and I think that's a good, probably the ideal ergogenic ketone to use for medical applications. I think the ketone, uh, the ketone esters are probably the way to go, or maybe for some military applications too. And we tend to focus more on the ketone esters for that, but for the everyday person trying to get an edge and to augment energy pathways, you know, Maybe the, the person that does not want to follow a ketogenic diet or even a low carb diet, I fully understand that and appreciate that. If they want to get the benefits of ketones, they could use an MCT oil or they could use a combination of MCT oil and like an electrolyte salt, a uh, ketone salt. Would yeah, that's that um, that, that's really fascinating. I actually just thought of something now is um, in relation to um, one of the uh, markers that we assess for aging and that is like DNA methylation, like DNA methyl methylation rate. <laughs> Curious to know if there's any rodent studies demonstrating benefits in terms of um, ketone application for DNA meth methylation. You know, that's a good study. So now uh, we're looking at uh, we're looking at that. We're looking at DNA methylation patterns, and we're looking at. Uh, histone modification. So my student actually developed a protocol where she can extract the histones. And then we're looking at histone modification in wow. response to ketogenic therapies. It's very specific to a, a genetic disease, but there's no doubt that uh, elevating beta hydroxybutyrate, this endogenous metabolite that, that we can make, but if you, you deliver it as a salt, uh, and elevate it, it can still produce that epigenetic effect. Um, we are very dialed into specific epigenetic patterns and signaling, uh, but the patterns that we're looking at are associated with uh, neurogenesis and associated with, you know, things that elevate BDNF. And, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Bajornson from Johns Hopkins actually developed a mouse model of something called Kabuki syndrome. And he published a paper that the ketogenic diet diet completely reversed or uh, rescued was the, you know, it was a PNAS paper, pretty high impact journal. Uh, the title of the paper is like the ketogenic diet rescues uh, Kabuki syndrome in, in the mouse model. And what it did is it actually restored the hippocampal volume so it, well, it preserved learning and memory and actually uh, stimulated neurogenesis and hippocampal volume in mice. In aged, so, was that in aged mice? Or? Well, in Kabuki syndrome, you have memory impairments and a dysregulation of neurogenesis and, uh, and normal brain development. So the idea is uh, to use the ketogenic diet. But with kids that have this disorder, it's hard for them to you know, follow a ketogenic diet. So the study that we're doing now is actually we're breeding up these mice and running studies where we're not using the ketogenic, well, we're using the ketogenic diet as one of the, one of the control arms, like standard diet versus ketogenic diet versus ketone supplement with a standard diet. And the idea is to create ketone therapeutics that could, uh, you know, enhance and preserve uh, this neurogenesis that's impaired hmm. in, in this this mouse model. So, you know, one could speculate that if you predispose to Alzheimer's disease or any other, you know, age-related chronic diseases that impact cognitive function, that a ketogenic intervention could delay that or reverse that. And I think what we don't know at this point is what is the ideal level of ketones? You know, what is the therapeutic level? Is it dependent, um, uh, for some people that Alzheimer's is like a bunch of different diseases. I mean, we just classify it by the accumulation of amyloid and tau plaques. But, you know, we, we said this like 12 years ago that the amyloid was a downstream epiphenomenon of other dysregulations, including, you know, uh, metabolic dysregulation, maybe like micro strokes and neuroinflammation, and maybe a virus etiology like Epstein Barr virus or cytomegalovirus or uh, herpes simplex virus. I get a lot of emails and communication from people who have various, who have dealt over the years with various viral pathogens who then 
go on to develop dementia and Alzheimer's, like Lewy body dementia, for example. So uh, I think what the ketones having, an, uh, you know, by restoring and maintaining energy to the brain, a hallmark characteristic of age-related dementia is glucose hypometabolism. So if you do an FTG PET scan, you see that very clearly, you know, on the PET scan. And as we age, we have a general decrease in glucose uh, metabolism in the brain, whereas as we age, the brain's ability to use ketones is unaltered. So right. if we elevate the ketones, then we could perhaps restore, preserve, and maintain brain energy metabolism. And along with that, would be the neurotransmitter systems because many of the neurotransmitters in the brain are basically derived from uh, anaplerotic uh, metabolites, right? So the, t the Krebs cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle produces, you know, succinate, malate, frumarate, alpha ketoglutarate, which then becomes the precursor to many of the neurotransmitters. So by, you know, maintaining brain energy metabolism that can help to maintain neurotransmitter systems that basically are severely deficient. Both of those things are severely deficient. Hmm. And why that happens in Alzheimer's disease is an ongoing mystery and debate. There's people who study only tau, there's people who study only amyloid. Uh, the, you know, there's kind of a scandal in the, in the world of Alzheimer's disease on, on this. I'm, you know, I, I have always been of the opinion that it's not an amyloid pathology per se, that it's more of a, that's more of a consequence. Of, yeah. Just out of curiosity, Dom, in regards to how we can enhance the effects of these ketone salts, I was just thinking about some research on caffeine actually, you know, preserving or enhancing or accelerating ketone production in, in the body what are some of these other compounds? Are there specific amino ketogenic amino acids that can also facilitate this process? Yeah. Uh, you know, I became very interested in like an arginine beta hydroxybutyrate salt and a couple, and, you know, we've worked with different chemists to synthesize these things and they're the amino acid salts are pretty unpalatable. Whereas, and you'd have to deliver a lot of amino acid to really get uh, a bump up in your beta hydroxybutyrate levels. Whereas, you know, if you take beta hydroxybutyrate and combine it with calcium or magnesium or potassium or, or sodium, then you can create a balanced electrolyte and deliver it. But I do think that there's still room for creating, you know, a, an arginine salt and perhaps making a, uh, you know, no one's done this and it's probably cost feasibility right now, but, but I think you could probably add some of the amino acid salts to the electrolyte salts and, and sort of, you know, we're, that's what, kind of what we're doing in the lab now is like tinkering, not only with individual agents like a, a ketone ester, but combining the ketone ester with MCT or combining the ketone salts with MCT and pretty much in, in every case, once we start formulating things the with a ketogenic fat, the ketogenic fat delays gastric absorption yeah. and the ketogenic fat will also get your body to make its own ketones while you're delivering the exogenous ketone, right? So then the pharmacokinetic profile yeah. of a ketone salt is much more favorable when it's combined with MCT. So that was like one of my original observations like more than 10 years ago and actually it became a patent actually. So like the patent of beta hydroxybutyrate with MCT is like something that I observed a long time ago. And that actually became like intellectual property. And, and you know, we observed many different uh, applications of ketones, like the glucose lowering effect, like the neuroprotective effects, uh, you know, the anti-catabolic effects. So one of my students who did uh, his project completely on cancer cachexia observed that the ketones had a really remarkable uh, anti-catabolic or protein sparing effect. Uh, not There's some data that indicate that it has an anabolic effect. I'm kind of skeptical of that, although I think it was published in like a pretty good impact journal. Uh, 
we were mostly dialed in on, we have not seen like the anabolic effects of ketones, but there's some, you know, there's some data on that at acetoacetate specifically, not beta hydroxybutyrate. But we do undoubtedly see like a, a anti-catabolic effect. And if you think about the evolutionary, uh, you know, context, if you're fasting and your brain is a massive energy sink, right? And you're, you don't have, you don't have glucose available, your brain would basically activate, you know, hormonal pathways like elevated cortisol, sympathetic nervous system, all these things get activated anyway, but they mostly increase beta oxidation of fats, which then leads to an increase in ketones. And then the ketones supply energy to the brain. So you don't have to catabolize all the gluconeogenic amino acids in your skeletal muscle. And that's why you don't waste away. But that's, that's really why we can fast for, you know, two, three, four weeks and actually not die and completely waste away because the ketones are having an anti-catabolic effect and preserving energy flow to the central nervous system. Mm. Super fascinating. Um, in regards to that, actually, recently I, d- I was looking at some research on um, sodium phenylbutyrate, um, which is completely different. I don't know if you have you heard of that. Oh one? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, oh yeah, yep. let's Very let's let's so. talk about that. Yeah. yeah, so sodium phenylbutyrate got put onto my radar because the Moffitt Cancer Center, which is like a short walk from my my lab, actually uh, had a glioblastoma patient that has nothing to do about the ketogenic diet, but they put the patient on sodium phenylbutyrate, the first author of the paper case report with Baker. And I've been trying to get in touch with this person, but the glioblastoma patient went into remission. Uh, and uh, it was one of the most remarkable case reports on glioblastoma because that doesn't really happen with, with glioblastoma. So, uh, so we got interested in sodium phenylbutyrate as an epigenetic modulator, right? For one thing, uh, but more interesting to us from a metabolic perspective was that sodium phenylbutyrate, the phenylbutyrate would actually, uh, it forms a complex with uh, glutamine and that complex. And when it gets complex, actually you urinate out glutamine. <laughs> so it is a way to, uh, so cancer cells ferment and they derive energy through the fermentation of glucose and also through the fermentation of glutamine, through glutaminolysis. And I became very interested in sodium phenylbutyrate as a metabolic therapy to lower as an epigenetic therapy. And there's, you know, I'm becoming more interested in that application, but, but my original interest in sodium phenylbutyrate was as a means to lower, and it lowers about there's about a 25% decrease in, uh, depending on, upon the dose. So sodium phenylbutyrate is sold as buphenol and it's used for urea cycle disorders. And you can buy, you need to take about five to 10 upwards to, you can tolerate 30 grams a day of sodium phenylbutyrate. Uh, like people with urea cycle disorders use this. So it's, you know, I have it, you know, in the lab, it's, it's one of the things that we're very interested in. We did not see like really, great effects in our animal models of cancer, which is kind of interesting, but I think some forms of cancer would respond to it. And I, and I do think certain forms of cancer that kind of grow and are driven by glutamine would be responsive to, uh, to, to this drug. So uh, it has a lot of different applications. Yeah, because I remember reading about its effects on lowering um, BCAAs in the bloodstream, so accelerating BCAA. Uh-huh metabolism um, and that improving insulin sensitivity. There was a study, I think it just got approved alongside. Um, yeah. Yeah. I didn't know about that. Yeah. That'd yeah. Be interesting to yeah. I'll send you the studies. The study is like a um, combination of uh, sodium phenylbutyrate plus Tudka, the, uh, um, the, um, the bile chaperone, um, yep. ex- improving peripheral ins- insulin sensitivity and lowering fasting blood sugar in humans by like 34%. There was some insane, insane value, but yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to check that out. Well, I, I communicate with patients that are using this and um, I think some of them are wearing like continuous glucose monitors. So I, I will have to see as they, you know, uh, adjust the dose and stuff to see how yeah. that affects. But 
uh, I do notice that, you know, the motivated patients that are doing this have amazingly low glucose and, and high ketones that are using, you know, sodium phenylbutyrate. So Don, maybe um, to wrap up, I want to let my listeners know where they can tune in with more of your content, where they can follow you, how they can learn more about your work. So do you want to let them know how they can, how they can do that? Yeah. Thanks for asking because, uh, I have a website uh, called ketonutrition.org.org, and uh, we have a newsletter. So sign up for the newsletter. I typically put in like you know projects that I'm working on. We highlight a paper, specific topic, and then we partner with different. Keto Nutrition doesn't have any products per se. It's an information website, but we do you know uh, collaborate with different different partners, especially supplements that I like and, and that I use. So ketonutrition.org, check out our blog. Uh, We do a a wide variety of different topics, a lot on different, you know, uh, like we have exercise, we have uh, neurodegenerative diseases, ketones. And then uh, Metabolic Health Summit is, I'm a co-organizer for Metabolic Health Summit and go there, sign up for the newsletter for that. And if you could attend it in person, that's great. We hope to see you there, Lucas. And But we're also developing a virtual platform because we realize not everybody can attend this event, but it's like a great synergy of basic science research, clinical research. And we want to really highlight a lot of the entrepreneurs in the space that are developing products and services that can allow people to implement metabolic-based therapies, whether that be a food product, a supplement, or an app, or you know, wearable device, or something like that. So I, I really think that advancing the science and application of ketogenic therapies, but more broadly, metabolic-based therapies, is going to really rely on emerging technologies uh, that can enhance compliance. Because the big yeah. thing is really with these dietary therapies, especially is just compliance. We need to have biomarkers that actually, you know, will show that these are working and then correlate that with outcomes, but, but also food technology, we need to, you know, have meals and whole food products that, that people can buy that are therapeutic. Um, so yeah, metabolic, uh, health summit and keto nutrition.org. Awesome. I'll, I'll make sure to leave those linked in the show notes for those listening in. But uh, Dominic, it was a pleasure having you on the show. That was a fantastic discussion. Thank you for having me, Lucas. And thanks for waking up early. I think it's early where you are, right? So, uh, yeah. That's uh, fine. so I appreciate cool. being on uh, having the opportunity to be on your platform, talk about what we're doing. Sounds Thank great. Um, we'll definitely be in touch. Uh, thanks for listening in, everyone. I'll catch you guys soon. Thank you everyone for joining in to today's episode. For in-depth show notes and lessons learned, visit nofilter.media forward slash boost your biology. This has been a No Filter Media production. Say what you want.